We pray, our Heavenly Father, let thy blessing rest upon us this hour and all through the day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Remember, we're one big family, and you don't need to stand on ceremony. If any of you find it difficult to hear, just take a chair and bring it up and uh, sit up closer. And uh, as you sit in these uh, seats, uh, uh, move close enough together so there'll be plenty of room for the uh, others, especially over Sunday. There may be some extra ones. And um, um, and we'll just all come together in that spirit. Now, in order not to wear out the uh, leaders and take all their spare time in conferences, I want to urge you to uh, attend the prayer groups that are going to, they're all going to be very powerful. Every leader is uh, equally good. And you will find nearly all your problems will be taken care of right in the prayer groups. So uh, don't come with a long problem to uh, discuss uh, until you've had a chance to have it clarified or taken care of in the in the prayer group. Uh, <clears throat> uh, some asked me to uh, tell a little about the uh, about the man uh, called Peter, and I'm going to go back just a little bit. Uh, for we've held our retreats in Washington and for years in Peter Marshall's church. One day he said to me, I, uh, after listening to me talk, he said, I wish you'd go out and see my wife. She's been flat on her back for two years with TB, and she's reading all your books. I'll pay the uh, taxi if you'll go. Well, I found her um, uh, with a cheerful countenance, but she said she was a little bit discouraged. Uh, all these uh, these years and all these months going by, but the first thing she said, I want you to pray for, is Peter himself. He is such a high-powered, such a marvelous intellect, such a magnetic personality that he doesn't always have to lean on God excepting at the big crisis moments. And so we prayed about that. And that prayer was answered. When he was appointed chaplain of the Senate, he called in Star Daly and me, and he said, I want you to, to pray, hold up my hands and uh, pray for me uh, that I will, shall be a clear channel. And Star Daly said that he was going to pray that he'd be such a clear channel that he could um, uh, uh, stand right there before the, uh, the Senate each morning and let the Lord just pray it through him. Well, he said, I don't feel secure in that. I would feel I'd have to uh, write the prayers. All right, said Star Daily, then ask the Lord to be with you when you write the prayers and have him write them through him. He did that so effectively that uh, they have been bound in a book as the greatest prayers ever given by chaplains in the Senate. He became so close in the spirit with uh, Catherine. They became so... Uh, completely, both of them so surrendered to God that uh, they got out a, um, for the Presbyterian Church, their Today magazine, the two of them prepared it one, uh, for one month and it was so, uh, uh, well, it took the, the church bow by storm that they, several years later they asked that it be, uh, by request, it was printed again. Well, then... Uh, uh, I told Catherine Marshall the, uh, one of the most effective ways to pray is to just put it utterly in the hands of the Lord and say, all right, Lord, if you want to keep me here in bed for the next ten years and serve you in that way, I'm going to be willing to accept whatever you want. I'm putting myself utterly and completely in your hands. Well, when that... <clears throat> When the play came out, I was thrilled when I saw that put into the play, where she um, had finally become discouraged, and uh, uh, 
after hearing her husband give a great sermon because I, standing in his pulpit, I could see the telephone arrangement he had by which she alone could, could hear every, his, his sermons. And uh, then she just rolled over and she said, well, all right, Lord, if you want to just keep me sick, all right. And then all of a sudden new strength came and she put on a wrapper and hurried downstairs. And when he came rushing in, as you remember, those who've seen it, uh, she said it worked in reverse. I call that to your attention right here at the beginning that one of the most effective ways of praying is to pray for a while and then, and then let it work in reverse by saying, I leave it in your hands. I learned that when I prayed uh, when I was about 44. I said, here, I have worn spectacles for 30 years. I have a very serious case of astigmatism, and if I take my glasses off, it drives me crazy. Everything looks so uh, as, as under a strain. As a matter of fact, after I learned how to pray, I rather wished I had something to pray about in myself. I thought it was unfortunate I didn't, I didn't have TB or something like that. And then it dawned on me why I had these eyes. So I prayed three times, and I got no results. And so I quit and didn't pray for myself anymore. I said, all right, I'll, this isn't a, no disgrace in wearing glasses, but... I'm going to pray for other people's and other people's eyes. Ten years later, I was in Kansas City to be there a week. I leaped out of an automobile, a taxi, to pay the driver quick because I was uh, almost late to a meeting. And not uh, knowing that I was going to jump out, he slammed the door open to come out and escort the old man out. And, and, I, the, and that singing door struck me in the eyes. Uh, sent all those spectacles all over the city of uh, Kansas City. I never found all the pieces yet. <laughs> well, I found I didn't need to use glasses, that they'd been my eyes had healed while I was praying for others. Now, I know that St. Paul prayed three times for his eyes, and he didn't get any results, so he said, all right, I'll just go on and, and dictate my, my books, my letters. But he didn't live ten years. I just bet if he'd lived a few years longer, he'd have been praying for others as he was, that his eyes would have been all right. But then he wouldn't have had that pet, little little pet born in the place that he's caused so much controversy ever since. So <laughs> we'd have lost a lot to talk about if he had. Well, this, all this interested me, the way that, that whole book, and that play, that uh, has been based on a succession of realities. How many of you have seen the play A Man Called Peter? Well, after she, um, after her husband died, I flew to Washington and sat down and helped her arrange her the sermons. And uh, he had written them in such a unique way. They were like psalms. They were like poems. And uh, the company that was going to publish them rather wanted to have them put in uh, orthodox form, just uh, line by line, just like ordinary prose. I said, no, you just stick to this method. Uh, but that wasn't the book that took people by storm, uh, as the book when she wrote his life. And, <clears throat> and after some years went by, she uh, wrote me, this book, which for 18 months was way ahead, the, the bestseller in, a, in a, almost in the history of America. And now the uh, War, Warner Studios wanted to put it on in a movie. And she said, you're my spiritual father. Uh, I want you to give me your advice before I decide. Well, my, uh, it came to me that we should wait a month, turn it over to the Lord and just let it I put it in the incubator for a month. And then it came to me, and it came to her at the same time, I think our letters crossed, that if there's enough prayer behind it, it'll be all right. Uh, she said that Garden Cosby, her pastor in Washington, suggested that she get her fan mail to pray about it. But she said, they're just amateurs. Will you get your uh, CFOers to pray about it? 
And so uh, what he made her hesitate was the, her fear that they would get a lot of glamour about it, make it a glamorous thing and take out all the spiritual quality. Well, then she wrote she was going to Hollywood. And when she came back, she was brokenhearted. She said they picked out a scriptwriter that just wants to glamorize it. She just sits there smoking cigarettes and want to make it a, a nothing but a worldly thing, a romantic thing. And I, again, I wrote and said, well, then let's pray about it. And in a few weeks, she wrote, I guess a couple of months, I got a letter from Mr. Warner. He said, I have some bad news. Uh, we find the scriptwriter is not the right one. We'll have to look up another one. <laughs> well, <clears throat> following that <laughs> bad news, <laughs> she was called to Hollywood to, uh, to consult with the next scriptwriter, and then such a wonderful letter. She wants to impress, the, bring out just the spiritual qualities. Our prayer has been answered. And then, when this came out, as you know, the people are invited, uh, just uh, selected uh, people, uh, religious leaders, to see the preview of it. And I got this letter just a little while ago. Uh, uh, dear Glenn, uh, <clears throat> you were most thoughtful to take the time to write and tell me of your reaction to the movie, A Man Called Peter. It means much for me to know that someone like you, whose judgment I would deeply trust, really likes it and feels that Hollywood has done a good job. It is a real monument to the omnipotence of God because through, though I was able to be technical advisor to the script, I was not allowed to be the technical advisor to the movie itself. That meant that I was shown all seven successive versions of the script and was allowed to make any suggestions I cared to. The studio was then free to accept or reject those suggestions. They probably accepted about 60% of them. However, from the moment that shooting started, somehow I was kept at arm's length and was not allowed to come near the studio. I knew that it would do no good for me to force the issue and go barging out to Hollywood anyway unless they really wanted me. This meant that all I could do was to pray, and during this period, I went through many moments of purest agony. I had not realized how much this was hanging over my head until I finally saw the completed version of the movie in the little theater at the 20th Century Fox offices in New York. It was then as if a great weight was lifted from me because I felt that I had been kept at arm's length in order that God might show me that he is still able to rule and overrule even Hollywood Jewish producers in our day and to do it even when those concerned may not necessarily seek his guidance and do not know that they are being overruled. Thus I do not feel, thus I do feel that the picture is a monument to prayer, just, not just mine because I wrote to all the people who had written fan mail about the book and asked specifically for your CFO prayers too. Uh, <clears throat> now, this interesting situation is there, that, uh, that to reveal, is revealing in this is this. You're going home to deal with very, very many people that are not uh, specially oriented in prayer. You're going to, if you want to get this into certain situations, into our government alone. You're going to uh, know that, uh, uh, that there are going to be cynics everywhere. But the important thing is this. When you find it's in the hand of someone leading off in the wrong way, don't let the cynics uh, crush you by saying, you see, your prayer didn't work. Nothing's going to come of this. Just get under it in prayer. And you'll find that they, you can simply turn ashes to roses. You can... Uh, you can uh, Take the materials that the others think are hopeless. Here was Warner who said, I've got bad news for you. We've had to fire this scriptwriter, and it's going to delay us to find somebody else. Well, all that's a part of God's plan, a part of God's plan. We're going to do a lot of praying here for the world situation. And uh, the... Um, 
and uh, people will say this isn't going to work. And there are many cynics will say, look at that meeting in Geneva. Uh, those, uh, those Russians were just trying to pull the wool over our eyes and uh, smile us into uh, lethargy and have us drop our guard. Don't you let anybody fool you at all. When there's enough prayer, like there was, undergirding that, you'll find that it created an atmosphere by which the thing which they pretended, if they were pretending it, is going to become true. Uh, the thing which they may have just pretended can actually come true if you put a lot of prayer behind it. Uh, <clears throat> In this movie, I was quite thrilled as I sat, sat there and, and watched uh, his appointment to, um, to the um, church uh, in Washington. Because it had been the church where we had had our meetings. And it began, as you remember, where uh, he was a preacher in a in Atlanta, I believe it was, or a city in Georgia, and uh, she was a student. Now, the person who took her part looked her exactly as she looked as a girl. And, the, and uh, this one who took his part, I assume must have been a Scotsman because he had that brogue so perfectly, but I was amazed to find that he wasn't. Now, out in a studio in, uh, in Hollywood, whenever anyone gives a sermon, the hundred or so helpers with electricians, oh, there's an army at every, every rehearsal. And uh, they'll just run for cover if they're going to hear any sermon. But this was something very unusual and very unique because there's so much prayer behind it all that when uh, the Peter Marshall sermon was given, they just gather around, they take their hats off, they would listen with an intentness it actually had a, a leavening effect on all of Hollywood. And that's the, uh, the you can do, you can do, if, even if I make my bed in Sheol, behold thou art there. If you just put the prayer there, have it go before you. <clears throat> I was asked to enact some of those scenes, but I don't think I will do that. <laughs> But I, no, but as she sat in the church with that rapt expression, listening to that young minister, and then when um, he came, um, and then when she went up to uh, shake hands with him, and the crowds kept gathering, and finally she had to go home with the other college girls. But then when she was, he asked, sent word to the college if, they could send him a young lady to go out and give a and uh, help give an address to a, a lead a meeting to with other college students, and the matron picked out uh, Catherine, and uh, they were going to ride 50 miles, eh? and he would drive her out there, and then they come in after dark, 50 miles. Oh, how thrilled she was! until she went out and found it was a station wagon and a nice plump lady right in the middle seat and she used to sit on this side and he on the other and then he said you'll find it easier coming back because there'll be some uh, one of the students will drive you back and uh, you won't have to ride with us and then her heart fell and then when uh, <clears throat> they had these young folks uh, address the other young folks and he rather overlooked her. Then she said, you forgot me. And she got up and she gave that sermon about the place of women. And she repeated almost word for word a sermon he'd given the year before. So he was just staring at her. And when they came home, they, they came home alone. <laughs> and the next Sunday or a few Sundays later, he gave a marvelous address on marriage. And then she was certainly wrapped and all that. <laughs> and he took her out that evening, and uh, they were walking home before he said goodbye. He said, what did you think of this sermon I, I gave this morning? Now it's all going to happen. And she just looked up, you know, just all ready to, 
uh, for everything to happen. He said, oh, I'm so... <laughs> oh, I just loved it. I just thought it was wonderful. And he said, well, I'm so glad because I'm going to take a trip around the colleges and uh, I thought I would be giving that. And so if you like it, that was fine. And then, uh, uh, good night. And she uh, went rushing in and to the house and he stared. He wondered why she'd rushed off so abruptly. <laughs> but uh, she went upstairs, threw herself on her bed and was weeping. And then the, the Negro maid came up and she said, uh, uh, Put on some lipstick quick and there, get your, uh, get all fixed up quick. Somebody wants to see you down there and she rushes down and then the thing, and then the love affair begins. <laughs> uh, very delicately treated, but very, very lovely and very true to their, to their story. I'm a thorough believer in prayer, giving these things to prayer and then you'll find no matter how things uh, may seem to be unraveling in the wrong way or raveling in the wrong way, they can be unraveled in the right way. There's a man in California that is president of an insurance, uh, uh, of a uh, lumber company. He had a salary of $25,000 a year and he is always worrying about money. And he asked me if I would be join his board of directors. And I said, no, but I'll be on your board of spiritual directors. And he would call me up clear across the continent when they were going into some special meeting to pray for him. And when we were having a retreat in Norman Vincent Peale's church a few years ago, I got a telephone call when I was in the Prince George Hotel uh, saying that the doctor had uh, said he had cancer. And can you come out and see me? I just need you. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm filled up all through this winter and all through the spring and I don't see how I can make it. But it so happened that that was the year we were going to have our first camp farthest out in Hawaii. And the Roland and Marsha Brown suggested we drive out across the continent and we could take the Water of Life, the book that I love the most that I've written that nobody reads and uh, uh, nobody buys. And when they do, they half of them don't understand it and those that do, uh, they just love it. So we were going to just live with the water of life. And when we reached Cheyenne, I said, say, I figured up the days. And we won't reach San Francisco. Or rather, we'll reach there, almost reach there, the night before we're to fly. And uh, so we'll have to stop at some little town this side of San Francisco. This Ben Johnson lives in a little town this side of San Francisco. If I only remembered his town, we could plant a... Uh, stay overnight at his place, and then we could have that conference that he wants. And so in Cheyenne, I called up long distance Stockton, a great lumber center from which where he had phoned me often. And the operator said, there's no Ben Johnson's in Stockton. So I said, the Lord will have to furnish me the name of the town or we can't get there. Completely helpless, don't know anything about the way. Now, I want to say this. When you're the most helpless, God is m most powerful with you. Uh, there's a great book written on prayer by a man named Halsby. Uh, I, uh, it's a very fundamentalist Lutheran minister, and it's so, so like wildfire through the south, and it only has one powerful chapter, and it's the first chapter. And that chapter says the greatest ingredient in prayer is helplessness. Just take hold of that helplessness, and then that draws God in. Well, I was so helpless that I said, Lord, you will have to furnish the name of the town. Well, we rode 600 miles that day and reached a little town in Nevada about six. And I said, it is now, it's March and windy and cold. I said, I feel like going into a movie and seeing uh, from variety at last. Uh, beyond, I just feel a little bit of a relaxation. And we looked in that little town list, and they only had one moving picture uh, place, and only one uh, different movie every night. Some very nice one the night before, very nice one the night, uh, the next day. But this day there was nothing but just rough shod, one of these wild woolly westerns. But I said, I feel like going anyway, let's go. So we went. 
And three young, beautiful young ladies were getting in a stagecoach to go to Sonora. Sonora, that's the name of the town where he lived. <laughs> Absolutely, Lord, thank you. When we got home from the movie around 9.30, which is 8.30 in California, I called him up. His wife said he just danced up and down for 24 hours until we arrived. He had never heard of Roland Brown and his wonderful gifts in the spiritual healing. We prayed for him. And some months after the, all this thing was over, he sent me a long distance telegram that the doctor said now that he was healed of his cancer. Now I'm not telling you, I'm not recommending you go to a, a moving picture place to have, have God talk to you. But if you just reach out, uh, and, our, and am I urging you to write a novel and have the uh, Hollywood put it on with all its glamour and all that. I'm not asking you to become a, a musician in a nightclub or anything like that. But if any time you're forced into any situation and you put love enough and prayer enough, you can simply redeem that whole situation. I can't uh, press upon you the fact that, that uh, God is no respecter of persons or of places. And if he wants to get at you, you just, wherever you have to go, just go and let him take hold of you. So many great things have been written in p prisons. Uh, Bunyan put in the prison. A life that was all wrecked and ruined and uh, lost in, Frank, in the Star Daily was redeemed and uh, everything was made new. Uh, so uh, don't ever think you're defeated. And uh, you take your very, as I mentioned last night, the poor in spirit, the meek and the mourn, all out of all those things, take these things. When the telephone first came in, how many of you can remember when the telephone first came into your town? Put your hands up. You notice they're all bald-headed or have white hair. <laughs> uh, now, yeah, it was a long time ago. And uh, there were six children in my father's family. And they had a hired girl, the nurse girl, look after the twins. And her feller was in a place that had a telephone. So uh, once a day, she'd chase us all out the house and go over to have some little sweetie, sweetie talks with her feller. <laughs> and we'd all gallop out into the alley and put our ears up against the telephone post to hear it. <laughs> and we never did understand why we couldn't hear those voices. We were told that it went over the wire. And, uh, that, and that alley was filled with about a thousand wires. And each wire we went off into a house and so on and into this house and out of that one. As time progressed, now there are only few wires. There can be several hundred conversations go over the same wire at the same time and then they're separated and drawn out in different ways. We, I don't understand it. Uh, this air is filled with voices right now. If I would take this... Uh, radio receiving set and just turn this around to a certain wavelength you could hear an address from chicago or you could hear uh, get another wavelength you'd hear the orchestra from philadelphia all this everything then where's prayer where does prayer come in well there's still another step before you come to prayer and that's telepathy one day my uh, Mabel and Eleanor came home they were 10 years of age and they said we found a new game it's called white magic and they said well how do you play it why you send someone out the room and then you all concentrate on what they're to do and then when they come in they do it so we said we'll play it when you have six children when we adopted some more so we had eight cousins and father and mother there was ten we could have a party any night we wanted it, which was about every other night. And we sent um, Eleanor out. 
and me concentrated, she used to hop up and down, and she came in and she hopped up and down. Well, I knew that Mabel must be giving her a signal, so I said, let's father go out. We concentrated, he used to kiss mother, and he came in and he kissed mother. Well, he said I might have done that anyway, but I'd never seen him do it, excepting on her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went out, and uh, they, when I came in, I didn't feel like kissing anybody. I didn't feel like hopping up and down. So I just wandered aimlessly around the room and then backed up and sat down on the couch between two of my sisters. And they all applauded. And I said, what's the row about? They said, why, that's what we wanted you to do. <laughs> so we sent out my older sister and we concentrated. She used to say, Hiawatha. And she came in and she said, Hiawatha. And the next night, that house was full of all the neighbors. <laughs> They're all laughing and patting each other on the back, going to have a great show. And he said, what did you come for? Well, we want to play that game. It's gotten all over the neighborhood. Well, we sent out somebody that was to come in and pick up a book. And she came in and she sang a song. Said, that didn't work. <laughs> we sent another one, out another one to come and sit on the couch. And she hopped up and down. <laughs> Oh, how I concentrated that night. I got a headache from, <laughs> from playing with such high voltage. It didn't work. We, weren't, we were not on rapport. You've got to be on rapport. I was in college, 11 o'clock one night. I wondered, I'd gotten in my cot, wondered what my father was doing that hour, and I could just catch a vision of him sitting on the side porch out in our in the great Oak Park woods, the great high side porch, and his nightgown, mopping his head with a sponge. Several weeks later, I was home, and I said, what are you doing four weeks ago, Dad? Sitting on the side porch, mopping your head with a sponge, sitting there in your nightgown for 11 o'clock at night. He said, it wasn't a sponge, it was a wet towel. <laughs> how did you know it? Well, how did I know it? Down at Duke University, they've been working this all out until they found absolute proof of it. Such proof that now they're going off into other areas to study prayer and precognition. They're finding wonderful possibilities in all those areas. I mentioned one to J.B. Ryan, but he said his wife had a thousand collection of them in an area which people can probably hardly believe. One was when I was putting my car away in a neighbor's garage and a wild bulldog attached to a chain was leaping full length at me. I could walk safely by him. He could three feet away from me at the, the nearest. But just as I was going to put on the padlock that particular night, I just knew that the dog was going to break his chain in the next second. Instead of putting on the padlock, I stepped in and pulled the door shut. And as I did so, the weight of the dog was flung against that chain, uh, against that door, and I could hear the broken chain rattling around that garage, which I fastened tight and latched carefully, until I began to hear it finally uh, disappearing down the driveway, and then I opened the door, and with a rake in my hand for protection, I hurried across the street, and when the owners of the place came home, they were out for very late that night, found the do door open, and the dog's chain broke, gone, and no sign of me. They were preparing to pay, see how much life insurance they could pay for me. I'm not saying that my life was saved by that, but I do know that it probably was. And I can't explain it nor account for it. But after Pearl Harbor, a woman came to my home and she said, uh, on the 7th of December, a voice said to me early in the morning, uh, send a telegram to President uh, Roosevelt and send a cablegram to Hawaii that Honolulu is in danger. And I thought that was so absurd. And I wondered if I was going crazy. I got uneasy during the morning and decided I, I, I might phone you. This woman is a president of a women's club, a very prominent woman in that little town. But she said, I knew you were in a Bible class at 10 o'clock, and then 11, you probably were in a church, so I thought I'd wait until 12. 
Well, at 12, all of a sudden, the voice, that same voice said, it's too late to wire the president, cable Honolulu. And I turned on the radio, and then the news began to come in that they're blowing up all these vessels out at, there in, the, in Pearl Harbor. She said, my conscience has hurt me terribly. And I said, could I have prevented that? I said, if you'd sent that word in, they would have thrown it in the wastebasket. There was a young chap with a radar, uh, amateur radar equipment in Honolulu, and he kept phoning to the war office in uh, Hawaii that he was getting sound of, of planes coming. And uh, they said, go sleep off your drum. And I, I'm not saying that that, that is going to be a, a means someday, but Duke University may find some folks who have that gift of precognition that could line up with this Department of Peace and send word and have them actually give it careful consideration. We're on the verge of some marvelous discoveries, but that breaks in the realm of the unseen, but it's the psychic. That isn't the spiritual. That's the psychic. The, uh, at a meeting of scientists connected with the Western Union Telephone and Telegraph Company, uh, it was openly prophesied that within a few years, within the next 10 years, every baby that is born will be given a number. When they come of age, they'll be given a little transceiver by which they can uh, tune in on the wavelength of that particular number. And they will have enough refinement of the wavelengths then that you can get on this particular specific number of anyone in this whole United States or the whole world. And you could, and they can have a little watch effect on your wrist by which not only can you tune in to anyone on their number and talk with them, but actually it'll also have a television and you can actually could, could see them. And you're way off on a journey, you're in New York and you want to know if the hired man has cut the grass. And you ask him if he has, and then have him turn his uh, television set over, and he can just see, how, you'll see just what grass he's cut and what hasn't been cut. Now, I ought to say these things are unbelievable, but the scientists say that they're right on the verge. But the great thing is this. Prayer isn't on the psychic level. There might be some danger. You might... On a psychic level, you might uh, concentrate, not only they, not that they say Hiawatha, uh, 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 but you might uh, concentrate and do evil things, like the black kahunas of, uh, of uh, Hawaii. Uh, but I discovered there, and because I've investigated into this, that if anyone plots evil against you, all you need to do is to send out love and you're absolutely protected as in a citadel. If someone sends out a wall of a bridge of hate toward you and you send out a bridge of hate toward them, and then they concentrate that you're to fall down and bump your nose, and you, they go trotting along their, their waist trots along their bridge, and then they find you built a nice bridge that saves them the trouble of, of building an extra one, and your hate fits in with their hate, so it reaches you and you fall down and bump your nose. But if you send out a wall of love, their wish hits across against that and boomerangs back, and they fall down and bump their nose. <laughs> now this is so true, and I tried it out. You begin to see that uh, Nietzsche, who talked about the big sissy, about uh, such as uh, Jesus, the big sissy, love your enemies, do good to those who despitefully use you. He was releasing there the most tremendous force for defense, for protection, and for changing those enemies. In the matter of fact, the meanest thing you can do is to just persist in forgiving and loving your enemy. You'll find everything that he's wishing against you happens to him and you're perfectly protected. <laughs> and you say, well, then that's sort of mean. I shouldn't love him because uh, I, uh, you should love him so much as you shouldn't love him. But listen, it will hit him, it will bump him. 
But I just said one of the finest things that can come to you is to get that bump that will shake you out of your amnesia. Here was Saul of Tarsus breathing anger and slaughter against the Christians. And he would root them out, root and branch. This one was stoned to death. This one, here is Stephen, the most marvelous layman of the whole Christian movement. He trying to convert uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus. And uh, Saul of Tarsus turned right around, betrayed him, had him stoned to death, stood there with his, uh, where his clothes were lying, watching that man die. And he was breathing hatred and slaughter until it looked like he was going to destroy the whole movement at its roots. And the Christians were afraid of him. And fear is almost as bad as hate. It made a nice little bridge by which that he was catching them, destroying them. And they, some of them undoubtedly were sending some hate toward him. But what does Stephen do? He said, Father, I'm sending love out to that man. Don't hold this against him. And so he went out breathing that slaughter. And what happened? It struck the wall of love. And it's just as powerful when it's up in heaven, a little more powerful than when it's down here. A boomerang back on him and sent him crashing down upon the rocks. Almost, uh, almost stunned him, almost killed him. But along with it there came the voice of Jesus. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And the greatest blessing that ever came to Saul, and the greatest blessing that ever came to the Christian church, was the change of Saul, the man who really built the Christian church. So don't be out of a, uh, don't be a, a, a sissy and uh, be a, so kind-hearted you don't want to love your enemy. Have a little fiber and firmness and do some loving and see what happens. I believe that so thoroughly that I wrote an article about it for the Clear Horizons and I uh, brought out the analysis of uh, Jung's marvelous analysis of Hitler. The superiority of Hitler over, uh, uh, he said, Chamberlain and Deladier, France and England haven't any chance against Hitler because he's gone up on a higher level than they are. He believes in invoking all the powers of the psychic. He brings in all the powers of the subconscious. He uh, insists on having the all Germany behind him. Anyone that disagrees, he has killed off, put in prison camps. He said, I am the subconscious of Germany. And as uh, Jung said, it, it isn't a, a thought that he uses, it's, uh, it's magic. Everyone said he was wrong when he marched, decided to march into Czechoslovakia, but they just rolled him up. You're wrong when you march into Poland, we just rolled him up. I said, if we can go out and get enough loves poured out toward Hitler, we'll find that everything he does will be short-circuited. It, uh, it will go boomeranging back. So I wrote to Glenn Harding and uh, Star Daily and asked if they could spend seven months with me going from, to all the largest cities. And we went to all the largest cities, having mass meetings at night and schools of prayer in the daytime, and we began on November 1st, 1942. And afterwards, I began to state and make statements in the camps farthest out that all our battles before that were defeats, and all our battles after that were victories. And it seemed to me I had heard a rumor that Churchill and Roosevelt had made remarks like that. And finally, <clears throat> just... When I was in the camp up in, uh, in Canada, uh, in British Columbia, just a month ago, I saw a set of volumes of Churchill on the war. Right in the center was the center volume called The Hinge of Fate. I opened it up, and I saw the statement there. We can safely say that we didn't have a single victory before November 1st, 1942, and we didn't have a single defeat after November 1st, 1942. He called it the hinge of fate. He hinged it at the Battle of Alamein down in, in, uh, in uh, Africa, as though that seemed to change the luck or something. I want to say that the luck can be changed any time you get enough folks to send, take prayer in control. But prayer absolutely in control. And we got prayer in control over there in Geneva. 
I don't know the Russians themselves know how powerful he was in control. They'll be finding themselves doing things, or if they don't do things in the right way, they'll find things coming in the wrong way. All I know is that uh, there's a, something higher than the psychic, and it is, it is prayer. And so having made these experiments with mental telepathy in our own home, uh, I uh, got a telephone call one day uh, from a woman, a principal of a school, that she had to see me right away. Could she come and see me? It was Saturday night. And I said, yes, all right. I had been uh, having conferences with people all day, and I was exhausted. And supper time came. After supper, a minister came over. He said, I just came to the city, and I just, I've read some of your books, and I just wanted to make arrangement for you to come and speak to my people sometime, and, and I just will take ten minutes of your time, but he didn't. He went on and on until I was simply fagged out. Well, the front doorbell rang, and I knew it was that principal. And he said, oh, I've overstayed my time. I must leave. And I took him to the door and said goodbye, and I was all fagged out. This lady came in, and as she came in, all my fatigue just washed away. I felt all just refreshed. And so <clears throat> I ushered in to the sitting room, and she sat down. And I said, I don't know what you want, but I know I can help you. Why? I said, because of the great peace that came to me when you came in the door. Oh, she said, you don't get it from me. And she was just trembling all over. I said, what is the matter with you? She said, my only sister is going to be operated on Monday morning. By the way, she was the most famous writer. Her sister is a famous writer in Minnesota. If anything happens to her, I'll be devastated. Well, I looked at this woman sitting in front of me. What could I do with her? She was a, uh, she was a Unitarian. Didn't believe in Jesus as a savior. She was a, uh, a spinster. There's a lot of lovely bachelor ladies, but she wasn't. She was a New England spinster. <laughs> She was a principal of a high school with all the tensions that principals have. She had uh, three strikes or about five strikes or against her before I'd even start to pray. I said, the thing for you to do is just relax. Well, you get a New England spinster with a sense of duty, principal of a school, and uh, who's a Unitarian, and you just aren't going to see any relaxing. I said... I'll tell you why I got that sense of peace. Uh, here are um, my five fingers, or four fingers, and up here we'll say is the Heavenly Father, and we'll say the wrist represents Jesus, it joins man and God, and you're one finger and I'm another finger, and you came in with a great need and God just and I told you to come and we'd try to meet the need and he just sent the great flood of peace and power to take care of your need and I got it she said well why didn't I I said because your trap door was closed tight and so it all came to me I said I'm awful glad you came you can uh, go home now and you helped me a lot <laughs> well she said <laughs> she said you haven't helped me I came to get help, and I said, oh, no, I can't help you until you'll open that trap door, and then you'll get all the help you want. Well, how can I open it? Well, then I got out the uh, 93rd Psalm, 91st Psalm, and I read some from it. I took my book, The Soul's Sincere Desire, and told her a few things in the last chapter, some of those psalm prayers that she might say over. I told her on the top of uh, page 39, and I will lift up my eyes. I've written a prayer there that to help take away your fears. Oh, I talked with her and all that, and we prayed, and she went. At 9 o'clock Monday morning, she called up, and she said, my sister has just been wheeled in for the operation, and I've been here in prayer, and all of a sudden my trap door opened, and a great peace has come, and has come to me. A tremendous peace has come to me. 
Well, the operation was a success. Don't need to even, well, if you ever in a prayer and a tensed up and the peace comes to you like that, that's a sign that God has taken control. And if you can't get your trap door open, get someone else on their intents to do, the, do some praying and let them get their peace to come into the situation. That's why the prayer groups are so valuable, invaluable. And so that taught me a lot about prayer. And I found that the way to uh, pray for a person is to love them and then to forget the trouble. Don't look at the trouble, but look at God and try to get hold of some, uh, some grounds of faith and then try to hold that long enough for peace comes. One day I was returning from a football game in which we had lost the game in the last five minutes of the play because of a fumble. As I was crossing the famous Summit Avenue, a vast, most beautiful avenue in St. Paul, under the gray trees there, Walt Whitman says, if you walk under gray trees, great luscious spiritual thoughts will drop into you. A tremendous dark gloom just settled on me like, a, like the wings of a, of a vulture. And I suddenly was filled with a terrific depression. Now, I'm not one of these that go up and down. I don't have them. I have a very monotonous even path. And <clears throat> I'm not temperamental. Temperamental people are interesting. I went home. <laughs> At supper, after supper, I sat down and tried to get hold of something that would lift me up. Ten o'clock, I told my wife she could go to bed, but I wanted to struggle with this, and I got the Bible. Tried to get hold of some book, and there weren't any books. By the way, I'm going to tell you very frankly one reason why I, I started writing these books. <laughs> it's because I couldn't find any books that would do this, so I had to write some for myself. <laughs> And I want to tell you that the bo a book that can do wonders with you is, uh, is uh, uh, Fr Frank Laubach's last book. Uh, what's the name of it? Channels. Channels of Spiritual Power. That's exactly what it is. If I could only have gotten a hold of that book 30 years ago, I wouldn't have had to send my wife to bed. I think I would have gone to bed in peace. But I just couldn't get it. I went to bed with that weight on me. I woke up in the next morning with it. Now it was Sunday morning. Sunday night came. I was addressing three Upworth Leagues. And then I, so I talked along the line somewhat along like this. And I finally said, now let's close with a prayer in which let's give ourselves like little drops of water in the mud puddle to the drawing power of the sun and be drawn out of all of our troubles and perplexities. And as I prayed with them, you know what happened? I just was lifted up myself out of all that depression, and I felt as light as a feather. And I went home just walking on air. My, that uh, I came there to bless them, and they blessed me, or the prayer, and the whole thing had done wonders for me. The next morning, Monday morning, a girl came to me, Ruth Gunderson. She said, I went, she said, did you get my message Saturday afternoon? I said, what time did you send me a message Saturday afternoon? Why, at 5 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, that great vulture had settled on me. And I said, don't ever do that again to me. <laughs> <laughs> You've given me 24 uh, very uncomfortable hours. Uh, she didn't laugh. She said, I went home to Kenyon, my hometown, for the weekend. My brother took me out riding, and we stopped at the home of a young a farmer and his wife, friends of ours, been married a few years, and their little baby had double pneumonia. They had a special nurse. The nurse said, there's no hope, and they were in such despair, I said, let me go in and pray. My brother didn't want me to, but I insisted on it. I said, Prof. Clark has taught me how to pray, I'm going to see how it works. And she went in, she shut the door, and she said, I knelt down and began to pray, and then I looked in the crib, and the little baby was so awful sick. I just went into a panic. I didn't even get up from my knees. I just said, Prof, help me. And I said, I hoped you'd hear it. And I said, 
I certainly did. She said, I called up the next morning, Sunday morning, and the baby is a little better. Oh, I said, and uh, I said, did you call up Sunday night? No, no, I came back Sunday noon. Why? If you'd have called up Sunday night, you'd have found the little baby was out of danger. Well, how do you know? I said, well, I knew. Tuesday morning, she came in now with a letter. She told how the fever had lifted. The baby passed the crisis Sunday night. They dismissed the nurse, and all the danger was over. Now, when Jesus said, go home, you're the nobleman, your son is all right, and they went home and they he met friends coming, saying, uh, your son is well, or what time, and they gave exactly the same hour. You can experience that. When you become angels, we were talking about that yesterday, and we're not going to stop on this thing. When you begin to try to tune in and forget your amnesia and know that you're in the area where you can also talk with God, now, you don't understand anything unless you have it in you. You realize your body is made up of minerals and vegetables and animal material. And so we understand rocks and minerals and animals and flowers and vegetables. But do you realize that you also are of the divine in you? May not be very much of it. Sometimes they tell us we don't have enough minerals and then they have us take some more vitamins for the minerals. Well, you may need a little more divine, but with just the thinnest uh, little uh, element of divine, you can understand what God wants. When you just put yourself in, uh, in his hands and uh, do it enough and with people that are in tune enough, You'll get it more here than you will when you're at home in the wrong atmosphere, I'll admit. I'm not sure that when I cross that continent with Roland Brown and Marsha Brown, if I'd been riding with a, uh, with a uh, saloon keeper and, uh, a, and a gambler, I'm not sure that I would have gone to that movie that night. I don't know that I would have been able to have met Ben Johnson on that journey. And it seems so strange that uh, I couldn't go out there especially myself, and when I did go, I went with Roland Brown, who has marvelous gifts in healing, and that the two of us together were able to do something which I alone couldn't have done. The timing of it, everything else, you can't explain those things, but with, when you're with some folks that are completely in tune, you can do some wonderful things. That is why we're going to send teams around the world, but we're going to be awfully careful. To not, we don't have to be great orators or be able to lead the rhythm so wonderful, wonderfully. But you've got to be in tune with each other and in tune with God, and then we'll know that unlimited things will happen. I'm going to tell you one night of the uh, one day of the of this journey that Roland Marsh and I took, and how things fitted together. But it's because we're all so in tune. Now, don't be afraid to be just a little bit, not clannish, but picky and choosy for sometimes when you pray. Be awfully generous and democratic when let everybody come when you want to teach them how to pray. Jesus talked to the multitudes, even let the hypocrites sit there to judge him. But he wanted to go far, so he picked out 12 selected persons out of the three million folks of Galilee and Palestine. But he couldn't go awful far with jealous Judas there and, uh, and doubting Thomas. But he wanted to go very far. He picked Peter and James and John. Now, with this particular team of leaders you have here, we can go awfully far because we're just as much in tune as Peter and James and John. And not a one of us is juggling to have the first place and want to give the most talks or get the, involved, follow the, the me or the... Or, or Frank, or anyone else, but Christ. You get in a group of mutuals that way where there's that perfect clarity, and you can really expect miracles to happen, so find the prayer group.